Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the book of Acts now, Ecclesia. We're here today praising Him and thanking Him. We just heard a great report about how our Yahweh works in great and mighty ways. So we want to send forth a praise, a shout to Him today because He is great, He's mighty, and He's worthy. Amen. <laughs> For Yahweh Elohim so loved this world that he gave brought, brought forth his firstborn son, only begotten son, and that all that would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Because he said in Ezekiel 18 and 23, he, Yahweh said, What good do I have in the wicked dying? It's better that they repent. And that's what this is all about today. People needs to repent. And we that are, have repented, we need to be in a repentive way every day of our lives. Hallelujah. That's His precious holy word. That's how good He is. That's how great He is. Hallelujah. That's His gospel. Pastor Bishop Jerry Bowers is coming now with the precious gospel of His word. So take heed today. Receive the word. Be obedient to the word, and you will live with abundant life, looking forward to that everlasting life that is going to be happening not too far off. It's going to be done in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So receive today. Amen. Hallelujah. Glad to see everyone here today. Today we're going to be taking a special journey in the book of Acts and chapter 15. So if you'll open your Bibles to chapter 15 in the book of Acts. Let's ask the Father to bless us as we move forward in our revelation today. Father, we are just expecting a revelation from heaven. Father God, open our eyes and let us see the world through your eyes. And let us see the provision of blessings that you have provided for us. We ask now in the name of your Son, Christ Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Chapter 15 is about covenants. And so we're, I'm going to take a few moments to talk about covenants before we jump into the chapter. A covenant simply is this. A covenant is an agreement that God makes with man. So that when you receive the agreement, you get what's in it. Now, now, let me give you a practical illustration. Suppose you decide you're going to rent a house. You, you've decided you're going to upgrade in life and you're going to rent a, a better house. And so what happens is you, you meet with the person renting the house or the realtor and they produce a contract. You know what that's about, right? So you agree to what's in the contract. And once you sign the contract, you get a set of keys. And the key gives you access. Well, God's covenants work much the same way. You come into agreement with the promises that are in the covenant that God makes. And when you do, you get the keys. You get access to all the promises that God gives in that covenant. Does that make sense? And so there are a number of covenants that are in view here in chapter 15. Of, uh, of Acts. And so let me just give you an illustration. There is a principle, a guiding principle that we need to get so that we can relate to all covenants. And here it is. Any covenant that God has given in the Bible, and most of them start in the Old Testament. You realize when the apostles were preaching, they didn't have a New Testament. They were preaching out of the Old Testament. Amen. The new, really the, what's called the New Testament should be called the Renewed Covenant. Same covenant. And, and so, <clears throat> these covenants, when you apply them through Calvary, you apply them through the cross, they take on a new spiritual reality. When you pro apply them to Messiah, apply them to Christ, they bring you a new reality. And those covenants have a new spiritual dynamic Powerful application for us in our day. Amen. Example. Most people are familiar with the blood covenant. We go back to Exodus chapter 12. We see the Passover. The plagues are, the ten plagues are falling on Egypt in order to set the people of God free to bring the Jews out of bondage. 
after 400 years of bondage. And the last plague is the plague of death. All the firstborn in the land are going to die, except for this provision. They kill a lamb according to the direction of God, spotless lamb. Its blood is put on the doorpost of the house. And when the death angel passes over, hence the word Passover, when the death angel passes over, he sees the blood on the house. Everybody in the house is spared. They're delivered by the blood. Amen. Amen. Now fast forward to Calvary with that. Come on. John in chapter 1 of John, John the Baptist in John 1, 29, looked up and he said, oh, hold it. Look, behold, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's pointing to Yeshua, yes, to Christ. And then Christ goes to the cross and he dies there. His blood is shed on Calvary's hill. And because of that, because of the shedding of that blood, he is now the Lamb, the sacrificial offering that causes us to be passed over when it comes to death and when you agree to that blood covenant and you receive that blood covenant you get the keys and you get to live forever wow that's the example of what happens when you take one of these covenants in the Old Testament and you bring it all the way through the cross through Calvary and you apply it you and you apply it not only there but to Christ you get a new reality. Now most Christians today live on the basis of the blood covenant. That's wonderful. Powerful. But it's not the only covenant in the Bible. I can think of eight covenants. In fact, I re recently wrote a book called the seven, last, the seven Lost Covenants of the Bible. And the reason for the title is they really kind of been lost in the house of God and they're not being used. Imagine that. Seven lost covenants that need to be discovered today. We're going to talk about some of them. They still are relevant. See, it's, it is a, a misconception. It's an error to conclude that these covenants in the Old Testament are no longer relevant. No, they're all relevant. They take on a new dimension when you apply them through Calvary and through the cross. So now let's jump in to Acts chapter 15. Tell your neighbor, look to somebody and say, we're going deeper today. Come on now, fasten your seatbelt and get ready to move. We're going deeper in Messiah today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So we look here at the first couple of verses and we see a controversy. Acts chapter 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small uh, dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Is there still to be circumcision? Now, the law of Moses is quite clear. You need to have this. Now, now here's the application. The children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land at Jordan. And one of the distinctive marks that you were, uh, belonged to, uh, to God as, as a group was that you practiced circumcision. And circumcision meant you were set aside as a holy people, consecrated to God. And they had, that had to be applied before they could cross over into the promised land. Do you know what the word Hebrew means? It means to cross over. Before they could cross over into their promise, they circumcision was a covenant. And when they agreed with the covenant, we're going to be sanctified, made holy. We're going to get to cross over. We become Hebrews. We cross over into the promised land, the promises of God. We got the keys. Amen. So we can understand that the Pharisees were looking at this and saying, how can you let these Gentiles come into the church and be a part of God's promises when, when they're not circumcised and they, they haven't come into agreement with what God said to do? 
And, and so now they're debating this question. It's a good question. And, and so if you go to Romans chapter 2, just go over a little bit in your Bible to Romans chapter 2. I'm going to pick it up with verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is of the outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, who, whose praise is not from men but God. Amen. And so what is Paul saying here? He say, look, when you apply this covenant of circumcision through Calvary and through Messiah, yes. it's no longer in the flesh, it's in the heart. Yes. And this, he develops this argument as we go through the chapter. So we're going to watch for this. What a powerful, what a powerful uh, application. Wow. Circumcision of the Spirit. Wow. Do it, do it away with the sinfulness of the heart is more important than dealing with the flesh Amen. itself. And, and so Peter now goes into defending the Gentiles in chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 7. So let's pick that up. So Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the gospel. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them. How did, he, how did God receive the Gentiles? By giving them the same Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. You got to hear something. We got to hear something here. His argument is this. When they receive the promised Holy Spirit by faith in their hearts, they became circumcised in their hearts, and they are circumcised. Why would you want to go back? See, this is applying the covenant. It's not doing away with it. It's applying the covenant of circumcision in a new way having to do with the heart. And so what he's saying is, why would you want to go back to applying it the old way when now it's applied to the heart? And all of us as believers now receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit who circumcises the heart, who sets us aside, who makes us holy, and who gives us access to the promised land, why would you want to go back to the old when you can have the circumcision of the heart, which is more powerful and is a fulfillment that we get in Messiah? Not doing away with the covenant. It's giving it a fuller application. Can you say amen? And that's, you know what? That's the truth with all of this. Wow. That's the truth with all of this. You know, Christ came along and he actually ministered to Gentiles before the gospel was supposed to go out to the rest of the world. It was only supposed to go to the lost, uh, the ten tribes uh, of Israel. That's the, the initial covenant was with. But the Gentiles were to be included. And so I can think of a number of instances where he actually went and ministered to the Gentiles. Can you think of some of those? The woman at the well. The Canaanite woman. The centurion who came appealing for his servant who was sick. And he ministered to them. Extended salvation to them. I want you to see something that's important that's not specifically talked about but it's important for us to get and that is coming to Calvary and seeing what our Savior did for all mankind what he did at Calvary was not only an act a blood covenant but thank God he had acted a salt covenant I want to mention just a few of the covenants because they're important for us to understand. These lost covenants, they're lost in the house. And there are more, but I'm going to just mention some of them. The salt covenant, the sandal covenant, the bridal covenant, the jubilee covenant. All these covenants are to have a reality and application at Calvary when applied to our lives. They are to prepare us to enter into the promised land. And friends, as we continue in this chapter, we're going to learn about them. Father, thank you 
for preparing us to enter the promised land and giving us the keys to the kingdom of God. In Christ's name. Now, as we continue our study in the book of Acts, we're in Acts chapter 15. We're looking at the covenants of God. And one of these covenants that I'm going to mention, besides we talked about, you know, the covenant of circumcision and how they debated it in this chapter, is what happens when we come to Calvary, come to the cross. The salt covenant is on display at Calvary. You may not be thinking about that when you look at Calvary, but it is on display. And I'm going to give you some background uh, on the Salt Covenant. Now, if we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, it says that David received the throne by a Salt Covenant. Now, how in the world did David receive his throne by a Salt Covenant? Very interesting. Well, if you go to 1 Samuel 18, 4, and I'm going to turn over there. 1 Samuel 18, 4, it tells us how he received the throne through a salt covenant. It's relevant because it speaks to us. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 2. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house, talking about David. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant. Now, this is a friendship covenant. And here's how a friendship covenant would have worked. You take your bag of salt. I'll take my bag of salt. We'll put them in a dish and we'll mingle all of the salt together. And to the extent that you could separate out that salt, you could separate us, which you can. It's a friendship covenant. And, and so they entered into that kind of covenant. But then it went further than that. It says that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And so Jonathan took off his robe, which was on him, and he gave it to David. Now, this is a, this is a Messiah type or shadow. This is Messianic. Christ went to the cross, and he took off his robe, and they divided it, remember? And then he gave to you and me because he loves us. Like Jonathan loved David. Our Savior loved us so much, he gave up his robe so that you and I could have his robe of righteousness. And then it says he took off, because Jonathan loved David, he took off his armor and gave David his armor. And Christ came off the cross and gives us his armor in Ephesians chapter 6. And it says that Jonathan loved David so much, he took off his sword, and he gave him his sword. And Christ gives us his sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And because of these things, it was legitimate for David to ascend the throne instead of the natural lineage that would have been with Saul. Because Jonathan gave his, the inheritance of the throne to David. There's a picture here, I'm telling you. Because of what Christ did, he now says to us, come sit with me on my throne. Yes, amen. This is a salt covenant. Now, fast forward to Calvary. Here is the Savior hanging on the cross. He's there six hours from 9 a.m. in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. His body is exuding salt. He's sweating, hanging out there in the sun. Praise the Lord. Let the little children come unto the Lord. He's sweating. And the thief on the cross next to him looks over him and says, I believe you are, king. And when you enter into your kingdom, would you remember me? And remember what happened? Christ, Yeshua looked at him. And he said, friend, I'm telling you this day. You will be with me in paradise. And he made a salt covenant with that man hanging there next to him on the cross. Mingle their salt together out there on the cross. And he got a new reality. His reality would not end in death and judgment. Now his reality would end in eternal life and restoration and a new beginning. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
Friends, listen. We come to Calvary. Several things happen. Because of the blood of the lamb that's supplied on the stake, death passes us over. Our sins are forgiven. And we enter a blood covenant. And because of the salt covenant that he had acted on that tree, we get a new inheritance. And we shall be with him in paradise. When you come into agreement, repent, and come into agreement with what he did, and he offers us that covenant, and we receive the covenant, the covenant gets opened, we get the keys, and all the promises that are in that covenant, we get those promises. Now, we've only talked about two of the covenants. Wouldn't you like to know the rest? Because they're all available to us. And, you know, here's what's going to happen. God is going, God's going to cause all of these covenants to be revealed again and come to the forefront. And here's a reason why. They are progressive. After the blood covenant comes the friendship with God. You need to know him. Abraham was a friend of God. And after that comes the sandal covenant, which brings inheritance. We're not going to explain that today. You can get my book. And, and then you move on in your covenants with God. There's got to be a bridal covenant that we see enacted in the upper room. It was a bridal covenant. And we need to know how to be in the bridal chamber and have intimacy with the king. All of that has to happen before you can have full access to the Jubilee covenant, which provides the anointing for the harvest. And God's waiting for his people to come fully into all of the covenants and have access to them so he can entrust us with all of what he has for the kingdom and we can reap the harvest. And it's all about taking them through what he did at Calvary and applying them for a new reality. There are people who are dying and perishing inside the church because they don't understand their inheritance. They don't understand what it means to know him. They know doctrine. They know what it means to come and conform, be religious, and belong to a club called the church and fellowship chicken dinners. But they don't know what it means to have intimacy with the king. Friends, we need to rediscover the covenants of God so that we can access everything God has that will help us cross over as Hebrews cross over into the promised land Amen. for God. I'm talking to somebody. Amen. I want to give you an example of somebody that learned how to cross over. Somebody that learned how to cross over. In John chapter 4, there's a story that's, that's told of the Samaritan woman. Do you know, you know that story? You've heard that story? Wow. Wow. When he finds her, he takes his disciples there because the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. And yet the gospel is not supposed to exclude anybody. And he wanted them to understand, look, guys, someday I'm not going to be here and you've got to go reach everybody that I would reach if I were here. And so you've got to set aside your traditions. You've got to set aside your prejudice. You've got to set aside your fears. And you've got to reach everybody. He went to this particular place of Shechem in order to help them understand even the hardest. Because the Samaritans hated them. And, you know, the disciples were nervous about going there because they could kill us. They could walk, you know, they could take our heads off. And he decided not only go to go to this most difficult village and place, 
in order to carry out the mission, he decided to reach the most difficult person who lived in that town. She was a, a woman who had been with many men, had a bad reputation, and it was so bad that she wouldn't go get water at the normal hour during the day. She went at the hottest time of the day, John chapter 4. Just so nobody would be whispering and talking about her and giving her those looks. You know what I mean? You filthy thing. We know all about you. And so she was shocked when she approached the well to see somebody there. And so she decided, all right, I'm going to get my water. I just won't make eye contact. And then she noticed, good heavens, it's a Jew. What, what is he doing here? And so she, she's just, you know, doing her thing, ignoring him. And she dips her water. And that well was 120 feet deep. So you can imagine that's a lot of rope to lower that bucket down there. And she's pulling up the water. And all of a sudden she hears, she hears Christ. Yeshua clearing his throat. <clears> throat. Could I have a drink of water? And she's flabbergasted. She says, why are you... A Jew talking to me, a Samaritan, in public. Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And not only that, Jewish men do not talk to women in public. Who are you? Well, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'd like a drink. He said, I'll tell you what. If you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would ask him. And he would give you living water and you would never thirst again. And she said, well, how are you going to get that living water? You don't have no bucket, no rope. Well, I'm telling you, you'll never thirst again. All right, well, let me have some of that water. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Go call your husband and let's talk about it. She said, I don't have a husband. And he said, yeah, you're right. You've been with five men and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And, she's, and then she wants to argue religion. Well, wait a minute. Your father say that the right place to worship is in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Our father say that the right place to worship is on Mount Gerasim here in Shechem. See, you know, you, when you start getting to the heart of the issues with people, they want to argue religion. So that's what she did. She did a, a pivot from, I'd like the water. Friends, listen. We need to receive the living waters that Messiah has for us. Don't make any excuses. Let him take away and strip away everything that would hinder you from knowing him. Father, bless us to do so. In the book of Acts chapter 15, as we look at the covenants of God, we find out that when we apply them all the way through Calvary, all the way, to what he did on the cross. They take on a new spiritual dimension. And their new reality that we have in Christ. Becomes a life changing experience. We access the covenant promises. Just like the woman at the well. We discover new hope and new life. She argued with him about religion. Now Margie and I have been to Jacob's well. Uh, it's in Palestinian held territory today. Jacob's well is protected by a Greek Orthodox church. But you can go there. And we did. The old priest met us with a long gray beard. And he, he said to Margie as we went down the stairs to where the well is, is at. He said, woman at the well, come draw up the water. And so it's still got the old hand crank. And a rope and a bucket. A tin bucket. And so Margie began to draw up the water. It still got water in it. And finally got it up the top. She was, Margie was tired by the time she got done cranking that thing. <laughs> and the, the priest took a tin cup and he dipped it in that bucket and he, he offered it to us. He said, here, you may drink. It's still fresh. Can you imagine drinking the water from Jacob's well? It's still possible today. We brought, we actually brought back a little vial of that water since evaporated. We're going to go back. We'll get, we'll break some more. 
And so she objected when he said, go call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And he responded, I know. You've been with five men and the man you're with now is not your husband. See, she was drinking from all the wrong places, seeking love in all the wrong places. But she needed to come for, to the master. Now, he wasn't trying to judge her at all. He was trying to help her see that she needed to come to him. We don't know fully what he did with her. But at the end of the visit, she ran off and forgot her bucket, her water, and ran back to her village. And all those people she was trying to avoid that she couldn't stand to look at, she went back and began to preach and tell them, I found the Messiah. Come see a man who told me all things I've ever did. He's the Messiah. She became the first evangelist in that region. And they all came. And as the disciples had returned looking for food, here's Christ looking at the multitudes coming towards them. And he said, look, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is ripe. One person was able to understand the covenants of God and make an application. And here's one of the things that he said to her. The Father isn't looking for religious people. The Father is the, looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I'm here to welcome you to do that. And you don't have to go to my mountain or your mountain. We can worship Him in spirit. And the Father sent me here just for you. Because He knows you're thirsty. You know what? Come and see a man who told me all things I've ever done. He walked her over the failures of her life, the rejection, the pain, and all the brokenness that caused her to be acting out in the way that she was and healed her. Yes. And that's why she could say, come see a man who told me all things I've ever done. And he removed that pain and filled her with perfect love that cast out fear to the point she didn't even fear men and what they would think. You know what? He wants to do that for you and me. And set us free. The covenants of God, as we've talked, bring us to Calvary to find a new reality through Christ and what He did. Through His identifying with His death, His resurrection, and life. We too, like the woman at the well, can have a new reality. And this is the message that the world needs to hear. It's, it's not about conformity. And some of the things that men do. You know, one of the reasons that I advocate the fact that we need to come back to the book of Acts. It's the blueprint where the church started. Amen. The ecclesia of God. Is because what's happened over the centuries is, is that that's why we have, you know, somebody once said we have 32,000 different denominations and groups. How did that happen when Christ prayed that we should all be one? We've gotten away from the blueprint. Why don't we do this? I've got a, I've got a suggestion. Why don't we just put aside all of those things that divide that aren't important and come back to the blueprint and what's in this book and the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Let's follow those things and teach those things and let's have the priority and passion and power that's in the book of Acts. Let's follow those things and preach those things. Yes, amen. I'm telling you, churches have split and started up other churches over ridiculous things. Well, they don't like grandma's pie. I think we'll just leave. Just ridiculous things. Well, I read a the theological viewpoint that says a thousand angels can dance on the head of a pen. And somebody says, I'm offended by that. I'm going to start a different group. Why don't we just come back and use what's in the early church, what's written in these chapters of the book of Acts, 
is what Christ had them preach. And largely, it was about the resurrection and applying the covenants. Amen. If we would come back to those priorities, we would find unity. We would, we would find an anointing of God for the harvest that would fuel <clears throat> the last days to finish the work of Christ. Amen. We become divided and deluded when it comes to the gospel. We preach all kinds of things. You know, in many seminaries, and, and you know, I've been in one. In many seminaries and Bible schools, we've been forced into the mold of the world. Now, if you're going to have government funding, you need to be a liberal arts college. And that means you need to have all the humanities. And you need to study philosophy. Because, you know, that's, you need to be well-rounded. And largely, many of these places, these institutions... They're not teaching anything about how to bring someone to Christ. I Let me tell you, I went through four years of Bible school and two years of uh, seminary for the masters. Not one class on the pastor's devotional life. Not one class on how to pray and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, and so that's why I'm saying we need ministers that can, can understand not just philosophy and theology, which has its place, but practically, what does it mean to demonstrate the gospel? How do you kneel down and pray with somebody? How do you go? To, I had no, no classes on how to go visit the sick and go to the hospital and be with somebody who's dying. We've lost the emphasis. You see, what Christ taught was discipleship. And discipleship is, I want you to come with me and learn how to minister. You watch me, and then you go out and watch each other, and you learn how to do the work of the kingdom. This kind of discipleship is really wanting and lacking. Now, on Friday nights here at our congregation, we have a class called Anointed to Give Freedom or Bring Freedom. And so we talk in practical ways. Here's how you lead a person to Christ. Here is how you break a stronghold when somebody's in bondage. Here is how you relate to and talk to somebody that has a demonic affliction and oppression. Here's how you get them free. Here's how you address the stronghold. Here's how you cast out a demon. Oh, no, I can't do that. That's why we have ministers. Oh, you, you misunderstand. The Bible says, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, that he raised up the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, to equip the saints, the people, to do works of ministry. So the ministry belongs to the people. We're supposed to equip them. But it's not happening because we're not following the blueprint. But that's how it's supposed to look. Maybe we need less preaching on doctrine, philosophy, and humanities, and more practical equipping so that people know simply, how do I go to Walmart and talk to somebody? And if I'm going to get ready to say grace when I'm sitting in a restaurant, how can I talk to my waiter, my waitress? You have no idea the burdens that some of those people carry, especially now with the, the COVID and, and uh, fi financial, you know, in some states, gas the gas price has doubled. I saw out in California, it's almost $7 a gallon. Imagine if you got a pickup, what it costs to fill up your pickup. Reuben knows. People are stressed. And so what would happen instead of just focusing on, you know, you can't wait to eat your hamburger. What would happen if you took a moment and said, uh, excuse me, we're going to bless our food. If we'd like to include you, if there's one thing that God could do in your life to help you right now, what would it be? Most of them will answer that question. And when they do, they'll open their heart because they're answering it like they're answering it to God. And they'll tell you, I'm really worried about my kid. My, my husband lost his job. Cost of everything's going up and we're, we're just having a hard time making it. He really needs to find work. Oh, ma'am, you know, that's so important. We just want to stop what we're doing right now. 
Because your need is more important than our lunch. We'd like to just pray for you. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So you minister to that person, pray for them. And if, if they don't have the hope and assurance of eternal life, it's a very simple thing to take that next step and say, you know, when we know where we stand with Christ in eternity, it gives us peace to know He's with us now. Would you just like to acknowledge that He's your Savior today? That you want Him to be your shepherd and walk with you through all of this? Can we just do that for you? You know, why not just bring them to the well and let them drink? Come on. But, but we don't teach people how to do what I call relational evangelism. What we do is we, we want to preach fire and brimstone. If you don't confess him, you're going to hell. That's not what people need. People need to know that God loves them and cares about them. And that he's there for them just like Christ at the woman at the well. Come back to Calvary for a minute. We got the blood that we can apply, that he applied on that tree to cover our sins. We got the salt covenant that we talked about. Friendship covenant, which means that we get the promise of a new reality and eternal life. Wow. God wants to redeem us everything in our lives we talked about how that there's a book that I wrote that you can get and I want to tell you about it it's called the seven lost covenants of the Bible now this is available on our website it's also available on Amazon we need to know what these covenants are all about the blood covenant completely what it's about we need to understand the salt covenant more fully, the sandal covenant, the bridal covenant, the jubilee covenant. All of these impact our being ready to participate in the harvest which God is about to put us into, but we're not ready. These covenants fully accessed and released will cause us to be ready to participate in that harvest. So I want to encourage you today, if I've said anything that piques your interest and in being more prepared and wanting to have all of these covenants activated in your life, I want to encourage you to get this book. It's not expensive. I think it's like $5. You can, you can get it at our website at bookofactsnow.com or on Amazon and under the title, Jerry Bowers, and under the title, The Seven Lost Covenants of the Bible, Rediscovered. List together List together, participate with all of these covenants so that we can have all of the blessings that God has for these last days and see a mighty harvest in the earth. May God bless us as we, as we move forward in all that he has. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.